Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to our second uh, live interview <laughs> here on the channel. Uh, today we're going to be talking to Max from ExoOptic. And we have been talking to Max for a little bit before the stream just to set things up. We're going to bring him in in a second. Uh, just before we get started, I want to thank Blake for helping me make this thing happen. Uh, and also that the first video of the Anamorphic Cookbook is out now uh, for the general public. You can see it by just going to the most recent upload and you're gonna get it. And if you remember, you are at the end of the first module. So uh, you're four, four videos ahead going on five. Highly recommend the memberships. We're seeing a lot more people joining the channel. This week we got like 12 new members. So, uh, it's a lot of content, highly recommended. I made it myself. <laughs> Just kidding, Blake did a lot of it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we got Max here today. We're gonna talk about the Maxiscope, the Nexiscope, how he got there, and a bunch of things in between. I hope you guys are ready for them. We're also looking on the chat, so send in any questions and we're gonna try to tackle those either throughout or at the end. Uh, Max, uh, how are you doing tonight? Is everything good on your end? Let's get started. <laughs> Hello, I'm doing beautiful. Thank you. Very honored and hyped to be here because this channel, when I was starting out, it was a huge, huge help and an amazing resource uh, for finding information about lenses. And uh, it's like, you know, I'm in, inside my favorite movie right now. So it's really cool. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Oh, that's really sweet, man. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> speaking of when you were starting out, uh, let's jump into that as our first question. Uh, how did you get into anamorphics? What was the deal? Um, you know, I, I've, I've always been into glass. Um, like uh, my, my first lens, it's, uh, it was a Helios. Um, it's a little bit embarrassing, but that's true. And um, I think I was even shooting like uh, uh, on film with the Helios, not even knowing what the numbers meant. Like, what's the aperture? It's like no idea. And uh, um, ever, like as as I was progressing with photography, I was really into photography as a as a student. Um, I was learning more and more things about how lenses kind of are constructed and how they behave and, um, you know, about their speed and stuff like that. And uh, I was really looking more and more into fast lenses because back in the day, I thought that, you know, shallow depth of field makes for really good images. So I was looking for like really fast glass. And uh, then I think it kind of died down a little bit for me, but one of my friends got a original black magic pocket uh, cinema camera. Good camera, um, so cheap. Yeah, exactly. And I was trying to use my glass on that camera and it was working like not that well because obviously it was super long. I had the 50s and you know longer lenses. And I started learning about like, okay, the sensor formats and all that stuff and then the super 16 lenses and just uh, watching a bunch of videos about black magic uh, cameras on YouTube and I found a lot of these videos, they looked like really, really nice. Uh, and they were, they were mentioning some anamorphic lenses. And Ruined I was like, for life. what are those? It looks so nice. It looks like a movie. And uh, yeah, and then I bought ESCO S8 and then it went downhill from there. <laughs> yeah, so I guess you always started, you, you've always been into ESCO optics. Um, one thing I, I, not I, Blake pointed out is I didn't explain what ExoOptic is. And ExoOptic is Max's enterprise into making lenses and rehousing uh, Iskaramas. Uh, so you started with an Isco S8 and then you quickly, let's say, graduated onto an Iskarama. Uh, <laughs> and uh, like Iskaramas, if you, if, you're watching and you're like, I'm not sure what, what's the deal about Iskaramas. Um, Iskarama is a lens from the what late 60s. Max is probably going to correct me on that. And they're amazing because they're super light. 
they're single focus, they have almost 1.5 times squeeze, and they have great image quality, but they also tend to go for super expensive. They're some of the first lenses I reviewed on the channel. And then, so why did you get into, how did you transition from the S8, which is a projection lens, into the Iskarama? How was that experience? Right. Um, well, it's like, it, it's been uh, EOS HD days when I was just getting into this thing. The Facebook group wasn't even uh, that popular back then, I think. Um, and like people were calling it the holy grail of all the adapters, right? They still um, do. They still do, yeah. And it kind of, I don't know, like I think it really deserves uh, the title because even if you look at like uh, historically at the company that made the lens and where it sits for them, I think it was like a crown jewel of, of some sort. Because um, ISCO started like as a half military uh, establishment. They were making uh, lenses for uh, uh, surveillance, like a re reconnaissance, I think is the French word, like uh, air uh, photography, like like Nazis pretty much needed someone to make like really high-end glass for, for that purpose. And there was no one in Germany, like, and, and you know, how, like there's so many companies in Germany uh, who do optics. There was no one in Germany who was up for that task. So they actually, Schneider and Josef Schneider from Schneider Koisnach company, like he established this as a subsidiary. And then their goal was to make this absolute high-end perfect, uh, uh, you know, optics. And they started with this like really, really high bar. Um, and obviously after the war was lost, um, like they couldn't do that anymore. Um, so they switched to anamorphics. I'm not even sure why, but they started doing cylinders. And uh, like, I think one of the conditions uh, was that ISCO was like forbidden after the war, they were forbidden to use their own brand for like 10 years or whatever until like mid fifties. Um, so even before they got their name back, they were already so popular. Um, like they had a really awesome reputation when it, uh, you know, in regards to making cylinders um, that, uh, yeah, they just took that expertise and then they just made this, you know, they, they made the, uh, the, the Rama, uh, which um, is like, there's this one interesting thing about it. When people talk about it and that it's like price bracket, they always compare it to projection glass, but this is not a projection lens. This is a lens that is designed for image acquisition for panoramic photography. Um, and uh, their goal was to kind of take that expertise that they had in making cylinders and uh, you know bring it to market make it available for like uh, regular photographers or well, maybe not regular photographers who had cash and wanted to shoot panoramic stuff and then project it at home for their families to look at like uh, look I shot that mountain you know stuff like that <laughs> uh, so it's it's a really it's like you know some, some sort of evolution for, for them as a company and uh, in terms of like the product that they made. Um, and it's really awesome. Like optically, it's superb. Uh, it was designed for full frame. So it works on full frame really well. And uh, um, I don't know, when I, when I snatched the first lens uh, myself, um, just, there was no going back. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's the thing. I also had the same feeling like Anis Karama is the only lens that I kept through all of the adapters. And it is indeed an overlooked aspect of it that most anamorphic adapters out there are aimed at projecting images while the Iskaramas are made for acquiring pictures. Um, I think it's a very, very important thing to highlight. And there's always the myth that the Iskaramas are going to get cheaper, but it just never happens. And I don't see it happening either. Mm. So <laughs> like more lenses come on the market and the prices just don't go down. Uh, That's a very interesting point. Um, being a, a bit of a lens nerd in general, um, I'm using these tools that help me monitor prices for various lenses. Mm -hmm. um, they calculate like the median price 
not a medium, but a median, mm -hmm. which kind of in, in excludes the uh, the peak, like a, the the most expensive ones that were sold and the ch uh, the cheapest ones. So if someone snatches like a two hundred dollar Escaram, it doesn't uh, like account for that. And uh, I've been looking like what's what's an interesting way to maybe invest money. And so if you if you look at like uh, index stocks or whatever, you know the ones that have like a steady climb. It's better to invest in Iskoramas than in that. Like, okay, I'm not giving anyone in investment advice, all right? But they <laughs> are growing in price more steadily than those, uh, like, you know, accounting for inflation and, and things like that. And like you said, there, there were a lot of Iskorama killers, like rumored, um, Ivasco being one of them. And it's. Yeah, we thought sells... about the Ivasco. We thought about, like, when. Uh variable diopters came to the market. We were like, oh yeah, these Kurama prices are gonna tank. And then Sure came on and it's like, oh, a full lens, ah, oh, it's so cheap, exactly. nobody's gonna care. Uh, Vazen also, but it's still there and it's still expensive. Exactly. And considering that the squeeze is not that high, like the series sort of gets close to it, mm -hmm. right? Um, but even that, like it didn't sway um, the price at all. Um, um, I have uh, like a graph. I'm looking at the visual representation of the price climb. And, Amazing. Uh, nothing managed to sway it yet. Um, and I don't think so anything gonna, will. I'm going to start investing in Iskaramas instead of gold starting right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> invest in gold coatings, right? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. So I'll invest yeah. in Iskaramas and I'll gold plate them. It's going to be awesome. We have a awesome. close up. If, if Blake wants to switch to a close up to show the gold encoding, <laughs> yes. that's a good time for that, I think. Yeah, so that's a perfect reference for what we're talking about. <laughs> right. right. Uh, and that is the maxi scope or the proxy? This is the proxy on the original Iskarama, um, so the monoblock. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, people don't often understand, like, what this is, this is so tiny. Like this is M42, like the mount oh, is yeah. over here. It's you just so throw it small. on camera and it's uh, it's good to go. Like uh, obviously, you know, you need a rehousing if you want to go below two meters because they were interesting people who, who were designing the, the, the mechanics for this. Um, yeah, this is missing a nameplate. Actually, this is not fixed in place because I was thinking like if someone wants me to explain how this thing works during the stream, I can show it because I can take it off and just like uh, show what the naked wow. Rama looks like without the body. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. Amazing. Um, yeah, it's very, very small. I think one of the sm smartest things is how the taking lens, uh, the taking lens, the base lens doesn't have focus adjustment like that saves so much space and so much weight that is just often overlooked as well it's also a 50 millimeter pancake and you don't kind of see a lot of those like i think nikon makes one but uh uh yeah in general it's a interesting design but isco's spherical glass was kind of mm, sketchy you know <laughs> not sketch just not that good there are some lenses that people recommend me buying and mm -hmm. i want to do that um but uh like i have a lot of lenses already so i'm just you know yeah i relate to that you're like oh this is gonna be great and then you shoot a little bit and like yeah this is great but i don't know when i'm gonna use it again right. and it just right. stays there right. um on that note of things that just stay there or uh i don't even know how that note connects to the next topic but uh, you have a day job and your day job is not related to lenses and it's not related to anything that we're talking here, but it still takes a full week of work out of your week. Uh, right. How do these things connect? Like how does your regular day job work in conjunction with what you're doing for exo optic? Right. Would you elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, um, I wouldn't say that it's absolutely not connected somewhat somewhat connected i would say so um my normal job is in design but in digital design so i'm a user experience designer which kind of involves um, um, talking to users kind of extracting the insight from them in regards to the problem that you're trying to fix uh, or like the product that you're trying to build 
and then taking that insight and transforming it into a digital product. And um, I think one other title that um, I sometimes have depending on a project is product designer. Um, and I think it kind of fits for both because like day job is digital product design. And then um, your superhero identity is product designer. <laughs> it is, yes, physical <laughs> product design. Um, so a little bit interconnected. Um, and I definitely borrow a lot of um, kind of uh, processes from my day job for Exo Optic, like trying to figure out what the product should be. I always try to work with people. I, you know, talk to a lot of potential existing customers, figuring out what is it that they want from the product, prioritizing things like uh, price over weight, over closer focus, over something else. Uh, so, yeah. That's one of the things helps. that I find most amazing about the ExoOptic page on Facebook is how you are open to user feedback and just listening to what people have to say. Um, I have the feeling a lot of companies don't do that. They're just like, we're going to make this. And then they go and make it. And then later on, they're like, oh, yeah, this was a, we overlooked this aspect. And this is not exactly how the best way it could be. While on the ExoOptic page, you're like, oh, here's what I'm thinking of doing. Do you guys have any feedback? And then you take that feedback and then you change your design to accommodate what people are saying. I find that like in ne completely next level. I don't, there's probably a better word for it, but uh, I don't see it happen a lot and I find it amazing. I wish I did that more for the channel. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun as well, right? Because you're talking to people who then take this and use it for something like uh, I had a person buy three rehousings and shoot a Lexus commercial and uh, you can find it uh, on Exo Optic Instagram. It, it actually looks really cool. They shot it on like Canon cameras or something like that. Very minimal crew and it was like some car ad and Iskarama looks good. Rehousings worked well there um, and they provided me a lot of feedback in terms of installation because they were installing three pieces. And they had a ton of variation in, 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 in the Iskarama bodies because they are plastic and with time, it gets really funky. Like if you store it on a side, the plastic would actually deform, go from round to oval. And then you put this housing on it, the metal thing, which is perfectly round. And, uh, but the walls are thin. So the plastic st starts you know, pushing those walls out. So in the revised version, I actually had to sacrifice a little bit of weight and uh, add like 15 grams more in aluminum just to strengthen the walls, right? And they were giving feedback like, I can't center this thing well. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, doing something. And I improved on top of that. So all the, um, so all the newer versions of Proxyscopes and Maxiscope have easier installation. You don't need to spend 20 minutes doing that. You can spend five minutes now and it's a little bit more foolproof and there's some evolution to the to the products, uh, certainly based on like talking to people and figuring out how they found the product after they purchased and things like that. Nice. Uh, yeah. So taking all this user, this feedback and changing your designs, um, what was what was going through your mind when you decided that you had to do rehousings? Because I bought an Iskara, I had like a couple of Iskaramas and the first one was modified for closed focus, but it was such a hack job. There was like a literal uh, popsicle stick on the ring that would prevent it from falling. And it was painted black, so it was fine. Uh, <laughs> like I've seen people hack this stuff all the time, but no one has like taken that, that into their hands and being like, I'm going to make this a product. We have Van Diemen making their rehousings, but they're way more expensive than the stuff that you're doing. Like, so what was the tipping point for you? Right. Well, when I snatched my first drama, uh, when I was finally holding it in my hands, the Holy Grail, uh, like, you know, I've seen only pictures online before that. Um, 
I, like the first thought was like, wow, this is so beautiful. Like the design, the curves, you know, the tapered front, it's really beautiful. And then focusing it on the, the second thought was like, why wouldn't it go closer? Like two meters, what can, what, what can you shoot, you know, at two meters? And uh, like now I know they designed it for panoramic photography. So they didn't necessarily intend anyone. They didn't even think anyone would go ahead and shoot portraits uh, with the lens because it's so 50, foolish. right? 50 millimeters full frame uh, was the anamorphic, uh, uh, you know, accounted for anamorphic. It's kind of a wide lens. So maybe they didn't even think that someone would want to shoot people with it, but like it's a uh, two, two meters close focus. Like it's, it's, it's terrible for portraiture, right? So I just took it apart like same day, I think. Uh, no, I, I snapped picture for, for Facebook and then I took it apart. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't have, it's not real if there's no photos. Pixar didn't exactly. happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just wanted to share, you know, that, hey, I found one for 200 bucks. Like, you know, good for me. And uh, uh, just looking inside, I was like, yeah, this is so simple. Like their, their, their stopper mechanism that stops the lens from going closer than two meters is terribly simple. Um, so I just started thinking immediately that uh, this could be fixed easily. All you need to do is just like, you know, manufacture some stuff. And <laughs> that's where I stopped that I'm like, as soon as it gets to manufacture and it's beyond 3D printing, I'm like, this is way above my head. I can't do it. That's what I was thinking at the time as well, actually. Um, I made some clamps for the ISCO S8 um, and that was it. Um, but I got inspired by a good friend and I really wanna you know, give a shout out to him. It was James Price. Um, um, I, I think I got to know him from, uh, from EOS HD and then we started talking on Facebook and he was like, dude, just, just do it. Just go ahead and make the thing. And I wasn't like, you know, he had to actually push me to do it. And I'm, you know, forever grateful for that. Um, by the way, if ever, anyone's like interested in uh, practical effects, James uh, has a YouTube channel called In Camera, I think. Yeah, I, I'm really... posting the link for his channel on, on the chat. And yes, right. his channel is pretty amazing. The stuff that they're doing yeah. is great. Uh, yes. And they just started so you haven't missed out much yet if you're just starting now highly recommend it right content is like top notch it's like coming from it appears as if the channel is like really mature like several years old or whatever yes um, yeah so so yeah so james had to actually kind of push me to do things uh, and he was suggesting things as i was doing stuff he was like you need to maybe like you know, you need to do this, like try etching on, uh, uh, on copper. Like I was, I, I couldn't figure out how to engrave the focus marks uh, without CNC. And he was like, you know, you can do that. You can do that. And then that led me to actually um, like uh, the prototype was made by hand by me, by this weird process where you take um, a special film, you put it on the aluminum and you mask out the number with something that is printed on a computer, like on a transparent paper. And then you expose it to a UV lamp. It hardens the stuff, but in some places where it was covered by the printed number, it doesn't harden. So then you take a special solution, like uh, some, some chemicals and you start washing it. So the UV hardens the part that, uh, is not supposed to be washed out but then you wash out the number so you have like this thin film covering the aluminum and where the engraving is supposed to be it's exposed metal and then uh -huh. you hook it up to like a, a, a battery and then you take um like a, another chemical um uh, like s uh, dissolved in water and you kind of apply it uh there and through electricity it's kind of like ripping the metal out so where it's masked with film, it doesn't sort of engrave, but where it's uh -huh. not, it does engrave. And it actually was wow. very, the letters turned out really thick though. And it looks terribly handmade. Like the first pictures of the proxy scope <laughs> that I still find online sometimes. It doesn't look as good as the, as the new one. The new one is CNC engraving. So it's like very precise, thin, 
nicer looking font is better and stuff like that uh, but <laughs> but you yeah. made it like that's the point you made the first one pretty much by hand we were talking before and max was telling me how he approached this small shop to make this stuff and uh the guys were coming up on with ideas on how to make the the proxy scope and just like oh go to this machine go back to that machine and then go back to the first and adjust a little bit and now like the maxi scope the proxy scope look amazing i have a i think the only maxi scope that's anodized in the latest version right now yes. um and it's it's a beautiful piece of gear. Uh, there's an Iskarama Pre-36 in here, which is the original Iskarama. The Pre-36 is a wrong name, right? Correct yes. me now. Very so wrong name. Pre-36 is no more. We're just going to call it the original. And some of the stuff that you get with the Maxiscope is a very smooth focus turn. You get close focus up to 1.1 meter. You get gears that are amazing. Uh, the nameplate Mine didn't have a nameplate, so uh, this came from Max. And it's only after he tested a shiny versus a matte version of it to see if it affected performance. Hint, hint, it does. Um, and you have all of this lens support, which makes life so, so easy when you're like trying to switch lenses quickly on the field. And you just slide the scroma forward and switch your taking lens. Like I find that the maxi scope is a requisite if you want to shoot with an Iskarama and you want to take your, your production seriously. And it's, it's easy to install. Like Max was saying, the process has been greatly simplified. It's reversible, which is key on a serious modification. And it's cheap. Like the... The maxi scope is selling, I think, for seven hundred and fifty dollars. Max, you correct me if I'm wrong there, um, but there's always a wait list. So, uh, how do you how do you deal with that with that list? Like, there's always people that want to get it. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a little tough. Um, it's like because I have that day job that we talked about. Um, I balance things, right? And uh, up until recently, Exo Optic was just one person, myself. Uh, right now, we're three people. But those other two people are doing stuff which is unrelated to sales. So mm -hmm. stuff that is related to sales, like managing, you know, inquiries and stuff like that, um, is, is taking, like, probably most of my time um, when it comes to Exo Optic. So um it's always heartbreaking to tell people who want to buy it that sorry you cannot right now and i need to add you to this weird list and i will have to reach out to you sometime later maybe in six months maybe in a year uh when your uh, queue is up um it is always heartbreaking i would love to sell one to everyone who wants one uh, but um, unfortunately, I, I'm not, I cannot keep up uh, with the demand right now. Um, so, out of curiosity, what would be like? What would you need to speed up your production? Uh, this is a surprise question. I didn't think of this earlier. Right. <laughs> um, well, first of all, mm -hmm. I would need to 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 place a much higher uh, order at the machine shop. Right now, I'm like small batch manufacturer, right? Uh, 15, 20 pieces at a time of each rehousing. Mm -hmm. uh, I would need to step it up to like, I don't know, a different magni magnitude of quantity, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there's that. Then um, surface finishing is like something that I'm battling because I've set this stupid goal for myself uh like this black glaze finish thing mm -hmm. um i'm actually gonna show maxi uh 54 blake if we can uh cut <laughs> to that please um blake's on it just like take a look at this 
this thing reflects in the black anodizing like it's it's a black mirror finish and um i've been comparing this to like other high-end scene lenses nobody's going through through this i, I don't think anyone's like even anyone even wants to get this type of finish because honestly for, for like lens performance it doesn't matter as much right <laughs> it's just to to make it look pretty and i want it to be pretty so um this kind finish is, is a good goal yes right um so this finish is something that is like very limiting i hired person uh, right now they're doing only surface finishing full time so this it starts with like grinding things um and then polishing things and then lapping things which is like this um kind of type of process um that uh, gives it a very uh, uniform shiny reflective uh, surface and with this type of aluminum it's a little bit hard because it's soft so you need to switch tools i mean it's taking a ton of time some funding uh, uh, like a significant part of the price comes from well okay now not significant some part of the price comes from that uh, and uh, i would need like a few more people like that full time just polishing stuff because it takes a lot uh, of effort i think get a warehouse of people just polishing maxi scopes and proxy scopes yeah <laughs> well someday maybe yes in the um, very near future <laughs> right mm. but uh, right now i think they make one they can polish one rehousing a day so okay kind of uh, evaluate it's like 30 per month it's, uh, it's not that much yeah no. um yeah and we're investing constantly like we build our own tooling we build our own machines we build our own process and with the anodizing shop and with it's like the whole chain you know it's like years of work went into kind of getting to where we are right now and it's still kind of not enough to to put out as 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 many lenses as we would want to or many housings as we would want to yeah yeah i see um how did you start learning about this, the, the manufacturing? Like you mentioned that James Price pushed you with it, but you have a fair understanding of optics by now and designing this stuff is not just, oh yeah, sit here and make a helicoid and uh, I do it in like half an hour. Uh, right. <laughs> how did you get into it and like how hard was it? Um, so I think both parts where uh, like both optics and mechanics, like I wanna say easy, I don't wanna sound like, you know, diminishing or whatever. It was easy because I'm so like, I wanna do that, you know? Like there's some phenomenon, some, someone posts a picture on Facebook and bouquet look, looks weird and I have to know why. I have to know <laughs> like what's causing that. And then all of this that we're looking at and talking about, it's like a bunch of rabbit holes, you know? And I am unfortunately- Very much so. A, right. I am unfortunately a person that is kind of like very prone to falling down those rabbit holes and never going out. Like I, I can't help myself. So anything, optics, mechanics, um, mechanics was a challenge specifically for Nexiscope uh, because mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure, like my current uh, file was the design, the, the digital design is called uh, Nexiscope version 17. Um, I didn't make 17 <laughs> prototypes though, uh, a little less. How many though? How many prototypes did you make? <laughs> um, I think this is number five. Like the wow. one that we're going to look at today is the fifth one. Um, I mean, I would have made more. They just cost like an arm and a leg and it's expensive because every time you get this new idea, you have to come up with new tooling because mm -hmm. like the stuff that we're going to see is um, what's happening internally. You can't just put it on a CNC machine and just be like, hey, machine, you know, mill that because uh, some of the stuff is really custom and um, you need to make your own tools and then build the process about using those tools to get this certain kind of um, uh, finish um, 
internal finish so that when the focusing is uh, uh, engaged, it's smooth, uh, smooth and uh, like, you know, no hiccups and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, uh, me like the, the, the mechanic stuff, honestly, learning not from looking at other lenses, trying not to look at other lenses because it's very easy to kind of get um, influenced. Um, mm -hmm. One of the first prototypes that I made was after I saw an um, Ultra Prime, uh, like disassembled, and I looked at it, uh, at the mechanics, and I really wanted to go for the, uh, the multi-entrance helicoid uh, design, but for the lenses that focus with the variable diopter, it's really not a favorable design because, again, of some optical things that I had to learn uh, mm -hmm. simultaneously about uh, why. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so those two things kind of feed into each other. Um, I, during our conversations, like you mentioned before, talking to lens technicians and people that service lenses and are yeah. in this universe of working with the internals of uh, these, this equipment that we use. Uh, how does that influence what you're doing? Like, are, is this like a part of your product design uh, side where you're like, oh, I want to hear these people opinion. Uh, how does it, what does it add to your process? Yeah. Um, I was looking for a mentor um, and I was reaching out to a lot of people uh, trying to get someone to kind of not criticize the design or whatever, but just like um, suggest what's the right way to approach this. Because uh, in Ukraine, there is mm, not that many people who can sort of uh, do that for me. You know, there are companies that are making lenses, but they're sort of fresh as well. Um, so I was reaching out to a lot of people indeed, specifically those who like service lenses um, to get um, advice in regards to what what is the stuff that I need to pay attention to when I'm designing, right? And there are interesting things. You don't necessarily think about them uh, when making a design. Like there is some more obvious stuff like uh, uh, thermal expansion, right? So uh, making sure that the lens will work in, uh, below zero and high above zero temperatures. Right? So you um, recently put your lens in the freezer. I saw that. So, uh, on our Discord server. Yes, yes. <laughs> it, it went both into the Nexiscope, went both into the freezer for uh, an hour at minus 20, and then into an oven for um, half an hour at plus 100. Uh, oh just, to make, just to make sure that it still works and uh, that grease is holding up well and that it doesn't become stiff or too loose or that the tolerances are still in place. Uh, glass was not inside. I want to highlight that. <laughs> I'm not going to do point. that. <laughs> right. Um, it, hold, it held up well. That's all I, I, I can say. Like, uh, um, it was so frozen when I got it out, it was burning my hands. Like, it was immediately covered with ice uh, the moment I got it out. So it was well below zero. I couldn't even measure the temperature because the digital thermometer doesn't go uh, below zero, at least one <laughs> I have. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so there are things like that, you know, that I'm trying to take into account. But also there are things like, how will one disassemble the lens? How will one collimate the lens? Because all of, all of them need servicing at one point or the other, right? It's, especially if they're used as tools frequently every day and stuff like that. Um, how do you uh, manage uh, grease uh, migration? Um, you know, how do you isolate the parts of the lens that do need uh, some grease, you know, because the original design of the Iskarama doesn't do that. You, you get like grease right next to the glass. And if you look at some pictures uh, that I've posted I've on messed Instagram, up mine. Yeah, I've messed up mine more than once. Uh, right. The one with the popsicle stick, the front would constantly fall off just in spite of the popsicle stick. Right. And one time I touched the glass with the grease and I'm like, oh no, it took so long to clean. Oh my God. It, it does, right? And it's not easy. It's like, and if you give that lens to a decent lens technician, they would be mad. Because like, you know, who does that? Like you have like grease right in, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little weird, yeah. It's pretty um, weird. <laughs> yeah. 
so you know things like that uh also like the problem that i'm kind of working with right now another rabbit hole is uh making it as silent as i can uh because i started mm -hmm. getting worried about that uh and uh yeah where did that stuff. worry come from like uh on the maxi that i have here i'm gonna rotate it actually i'm gonna move it close to the mic and it's so silent and at the end it has a very loud like it feels yeah. loud on set it doesn't feel loud but rotating it by hand there's a pop to it and it's strange it like it feels so solid uh right. but uh, so you're you're tackling this issue now so it's like a, it's a chain of stuff right so uh -huh. starting like we're slowly migrating into discussing nexus scope let's do that um yes <laughs> so it all starts with the variable diopter right that it sits in front of uh, the anamorphic glass in iskarama the one that performs focusing and uh, to get closer focus you need to space those lenses further to get even closer, the distance that you need to space them gets, unfortunately, larger. Mm -hmm. So the closer you focus, the more you need to, to space mm -hmm. them apart. Uh -huh. Yes. So to achieve the close focus, which measured from the sensor for Nexus scope is 0 0.7 meters. Wow. Um, to achieve that, you need to move the front a lot. Mm -hmm. But due to the nature of this focusing mechanism, um, you would get, like if you use a helicoid, which has a constant uh, kind of angle to it. So you rotate it a certain amount of degrees and it misplaces the front a certain amount of millimeters, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like it's a linear correlation between the exactly. rotation and the movement. Exactly. That would mean that to go from infinity to two meters, you rotated some amount, 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. And then to go from two meters to one meters, uh, one meter, it's another 45 degrees. And then to go to 75, it's another 45. So it's going to be terribly slow at close focus. Like, mm -hmm. and then it's going to be really, really fast uh, closer to infinity. Uh -huh. And looking at cine lenses and what they do, and again, talking to people, uh, if you want to shoot, if you want to shoot like a building, which is not at infinity, but it's like 200 meters away from you or 100 meters away from you, like there's a scene and you need cr critical focus, having a little bit more of that control at infinity is really helpful. And then oh, yeah. speeding the front up as you get to close focus is also very important. So the design that I've adopted with the cam mechanism um, has like a nonlinear cam. So it's actually speeding up um, at close focus and slowing down uh, at infinity. So you get like a lot of precise control in infinity and at close focus, you don't need to, you know, twist and twist and twist until you um, get to your uh, minimum focus. And so that design called for a different transport system for the front element. So that transport system is carried on these miniature uh, kind of rollers and those rollers are making some sound, which I think at the moment I'm the only person who's concerned about it, and <laughs> I had to I had to compare it to like uh, other lenses, high end lenses, and I did compare it, and uh, uh, it was less loud than those, like less loud than. Cooks, but you're still bothered by it. I am still bothered by it because if I don't fix it, I will have like I don't know, I will lose sleep, and I will be like worried that someone on set will get their scratch audio ruined because uh, one of my friends told me like, hey, this can ruin scratch audio, and I'm not necessarily oh trying trying to sell this to people who use scratch audio, but still, I have this bug. I need to fix this now because um, I, I want it to be as good as as I can make it. So. Yeah, what I found most interesting about the, the click on the Maxiscope is that while it does it when I'm doing it by hand, when I put on uh, a wireless follow focus and it calibrates, the click is no longer there because the, the follow focus is not going to push it past. It's not going to try to push it past. Right. So it becomes very silent again. And right. it's just so light to turn it. I love it. Right. <laughs> Well, Maxi is metal to metal. So there are like two metal stoppers and the click comes from two metal parts colliding. Mm -hmm. Nexiscope is different 
it's like some polymer parts now uh, just recently assembled like a couple of days ago um, and it's not as loud anymore uh, metal on metal is much louder this is like very manageable now i would say much more silent than the other lenses that i was trying so uh, that goal achieved i guess nice so i was i was talking to max yesterday we were both like very excited and max send me, sends me a message saying i'm hoping to get the nexi anodized in time for the stream <laughs> yeah. so uh we're gonna take a, a first look at the nexi scope now and is this the first time that the world has seen the nexi scope <laughs> yes it is <laughs> amazing wow all right it's ready to Blake. All right. We can cut to it. <laughs> so there Walk it is. Walk us through. <laughs> well, like we didn't necessarily plan to go through, um, uh, through the details today. Yes. Um, Very true. Uh, the one thing that I saw you do earlier and I didn't comment, but it blew my mind was you were rotating the focus with just one finger and, and it was just so smooth and the lens wasn't moving. So I'm like, how? I don't think I have one lens that I can do that. <laughs> right. So that's that's the focusing uh, mechanism in action. Uh, indeed, I can uh, focus it with a pinky. Uh, maybe I should do it <laughs> just for everyone to see. So um, light. It is. I had so many concerns about this because like, I you don't want it to be too light. So what is too light? And what is not light enough? Like, how do you find that balance? So the balance is pretty much make it enjoyable, consistent, smooth, but make sure that it's not so light that when you kind of flip the lens over under its own weight, that it's going to kind of, you know, the lens is going to drag the focus ring. So this doesn't do that, thank God. Um, you can see that this is a prototype, by the way, I should have mentioned that uh, before. It has some parts that are not in place. So you can see it, it, it's got a naked butt right now. Uh, you mm -hmm. will have to excuse it. Um, <laughs> it's going to Lose have like this. Monetizing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, it's going to have this cover over here that is going to also be a lens support and um, like a positive locking ring to attach it to uh, spherical lenses. So that thing I did not prototype because after four previous prototypes that I did not like, I was assuming that this is going to have something wrong with it because like prototypes usually never go well um but this thing it, like was assembled in the machine shop without degrees and it worked straight out of the box which still is a little mind-blowing to me so uh, the design i think is um uh, now it's spot on i can i can say that this is the design that i want to go with um nice. so like I'll try to demonstrate what I was talking about. So this is infinity. And as I focus right now, I'm not sure if it translates like, through, I think it does. It's very like um, soft curve right now. It doesn't speed yeah. up that fast. So it gives you um, all those focus marks um, spaced more evenly closer to infinity, like 200 meters, 100 meters and 50. But then as you get to like a minimum range, it speeds up a little bit more like that. And then as you get to close focus, it ramps up even more. So at close focus, you still get all those focus marks spaced like I think 10 centimeters, 15 or 25 later apart. So it's not like you lose control at close focus. You just don't have this sloppy kind of feeling at close yeah. focus. Yeah, like a mark for every 10 centimeters and they're like 45 degrees apart. Exactly, yeah. Um, um, the front is static now. It's uh, non-rotating, unlike um, any other rehousing mm, that I did before, or, or unlike the original Iskorama. This is a 95 millimeter um, OD for the clamp on mat boxes. And a cool thing about it is that this part is not screwed on. This is a solid piece that goes like deeper inside the body and deeper and deeper and deeper. And it goes all the way to the end, grabbing on the Iskorama there. So it's one solid piece and you can clamp on a mat box to it and load it with whatever you want to. And this will not bulge because it's one solid nice. piece of metal. So, good. Um, so um, yeah, as you can see, the front moves. 
and I'm really, really contemplating the idea right now of making the front static and making the rear element move for focusing to kind of have it completely static. Uh That would, that wouldn't, that would not necessarily require a lot of change. You pretty much just like mirror one part, um, internal part, and then uh, you fix this in place. However, there's one large aspect to this that I'm kind of, I have to take into consideration when designing again, this is a DIY kit. Wow. So, So people could assemble this themselves. Exactly. That's the goal. And the assembly process with this is terribly, terribly simple. Like this whole part here on screws, um, Mm -hmm. this uh, front uh, plate, which was supposed to be matte, but uh, because I was anodizing it last day, I couldn't make it uh, matte. And then um, the process of rehousing, like this comes assembled to you. You don't need to kind of fiddle with anything. You just take your iskarama, you pop off the plastic body off, you drop it in here into the, like the assembled body. And on the back, there are four screws. And uh, you just tighten them. They will grab the optical block in place. And then this little washer, where is that? It gets tightened and you're pretty much done. So the installation is very comparable to other uh, lenses. You do need to, I meant other rehousing, sorry. Uh, you do need to get the front element out of its original housing place in here. I assume it will scare some people. Uh, that's why with all the rehousings, not just this one, any other rehousing, Proxyscope, Maxiscope, um, I offer free installation. So you ship mm-hmm. the lens over to me and I install it for free. Um, and CLA comes at half the price uh, if you purchase a rehousing. So uh, I've been doing CLA on Iskaramas for a lot of people, like uh, collimating to infinity. I have a, a small collimator here, which is uh, precise enough for uh, Iskarama work. And um, yeah, so that's kind of like a, the DIY installation aspect is something that is a little bit limiting. Uh, so I'm contemplating maybe a different version, like call it something else, another confusing mm-hmm. name that sounds just like the other ones. And uh, ends with scope. Yes, <laughs> axiscope, yes. <laughs> and then um, and then just make it completely static, front um, and um, uh, internal focus. Um, and only install it in-house because uh, it's, I mean, not scary for me at all. Be a little more complicated. A tad, uh, and I wouldn't say complicated, scary for sure. Because okay. if people are just, if someone is a DP, and that's the majority of people who reach out to me asking to purchase one, if someone is a DP, they probably will not want to go inside a $4,000 lens. That's why I offer free installation for everyone. Because uh, for me, it's, um, it's fun, and then it doesn't take that much time. Oh, but, it's so uh, much fun. <laughs> it is. Yeah, um, and you collimated my my scorema because I I was using it for the the shootout, which is still a secret. I guess not that much more of a secret uh, right. at this moment. Uh, and you send it over in like ultra fast speed. You're like, hey Max, how long does it take to collimate this? And you're like, oh, just a couple of hours. I'm like, okay. Right. Uh, <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, I don't even know where to start with this. Um, the collimation for like the regular check uh, that, um, you know, when I'm servicing a lens for someone, I never build anyone more than five hours. I think that includes disassembly, cleaning, uh, relubing the original helicoid, and then collimating, and then rehousing and cleaning everything and just sending it off. Um, so yeah, it's, it's ultra fast. And then we have DHL, which is like one day shipping. I think they delivered in one day from me to yeah. you, which is crazy. Cause that's like <laughs> literally the other side of the world. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, I've installed an ND filter, by the way, as we were speaking um, to kind of show how that, uh, how that works. In the front. Yep. Yeah. So it goes inside. Like you can still uh, use screw and filtration and you oh, can man. use diopters, variable ND will fit in here as well. Although like the oversized ones might not, but the regular ones, um, 
Uh, they certainly do. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, it works just that, like that, but you can obviously use uh, Matbox with it as well if you want to. This is amazing. Uh, we're getting to the end of our stream here. We got four minutes left. This was one of the quietest streams in terms of people asking a thousand questions. I think everybody was just so mesmerized by everything that you're showing. Uh, it was amazing. If you guys got any questions, now's the time. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to talk about some more fun stuff. I don't even know what else is fun that we haven't covered yet. <laughs> Well, I think, I guess since we're talking about like, you know, how I got to things, I think like what I have planned is a very interesting uh, topic because if we can cut back, uh, Blake, please, uh, to the, to the <laughs> close up here again, like a little consequence of this design um, is that it's modular. And I, I don't want to pretend like as, as if I planned it this way, I did not but it just came out this way. Uh, my friend Tim sent me this recently, which is the Isco widescreen 2000 MC. And it's an Iscorama in disguise without a focusing diopter. And this thing coincidentally pop in here, pops in here as well, just fits like a glove. And then what you can do is get your glass like this from Hardcore DNA, the, this specific example was beautiful uh, green coating. You just, you just <laughs> the take irony. This yes, the irony. And you just take this glass holder part, which is like just a ring that holds glass in place, and you replace the glass in it with this one. And you get an Iskarama that has better coverage than the original, goes wider, which is like, yay, you know, huge win for everyone. And then What's also awesome is that you're not necessarily limited to hardcore DNA glass. You can get FVD glass and just make holders for that. And oh you're not limited to ISCO 2000 MC. For this very reason, I have the Bolex 1632 on away, which you can pop in here and pop hardcore DNA glass in front of it and have this exact mechanics, which is, I don't know, I consider it quite good, uh, better than what those... Uh, you know, standalone units can offer to you and you can get a, like a unibody monoblock single focus adapter that you can just swap with your taking lenses. Um, so that's, a, that's an interesting kind of aspect about it, but also something that I do have on a roadmap. So if anyone here is interested to kind of provide their feedback in regards to that, I am very interested to know what you think of it. Um, I have this little uh, gem here uh, which is uh, a taken lens from a Lomo square front anamorphic. It's um, a 35 millimeter lens. It covers super 35 really well, has a really beautiful character, and it's also teeny tiny uh, little lens. So what you can do is this and just throw it inside a PL mount, which is not even going to be here. Like it's going to almost... Uh, be here, just get an iris ring here, and this is your lens. Um, and you can get a set of like, I don't know, anamorphic micro primes with vintage character, with all original vintage glass, uh, beautiful image, and minuscule for your. If I don't know, there's a wait or... list for that, place me on first. <laughs> 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 okay, we're, we're starting wait list now, because this is the first right time now. I'm talking about this. Yes, we're starting the wait list now. You're number two, because I would like the set of those myself, honestly <laughs> speaking. Because, um, you know, all these Iskaramas laying around, we better put them yeah. to good use. Amazing. This is mind-blowing. This modular thing is, is amazing. I find it to be transformative for uh, filmmaking in general, but I didn't know... I did not know it could be so applicable to lenses. I don't think I've seen this before. Uh, so congrats. This is amazing. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Very excited about this myself. Yeah. Um, people are just saying that they missed their ISCO 2000s and everybody's mind blown that 
uh, you can fit an ISCO 30, uh, a Bolex 1632 in there. Uh, so basically you've blown everyone away and no questions. This is a first, this is definitely a first. Uh, it's 1201. So it's been a really great pleasure talking to you, Max. And I look forward to the next one. Uh, you mentioned a uh, Skurama video, like a, almost a documentary about it. And I would be very, very curious to see that eventually. Yes, I want to do that, but I also want to do other things. I shot the thing. I didn't do post-production for it. It's on my hard drive for months now. Um, thanks for putting me on a spot with that. <laughs> now I kind of have I to do it. I took my <laughs> chance. I was like, Max is going to hate me for this, but you know what? He deserves it. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. I'll do it eventually. Like when I have products out, when I have all of that kind of rolling smoothly, I'll get to it one day for sure. I want to share like, you know, more of uh, what I know because there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, surrounding this lens. Uh, yeah, but I really appreciate you having me. It was great pleasure uh, and uh, really nice to talk to you in real time again. Uh, Very I true. Really, I'm really waiting until we can travel and then, you know, to, uh, to hang out in person. That would oh be, yeah, Anamorphic Meetup Part 2, COVID free edition. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really, really looking forward to that. Yeah. Okay, so on this hopeful note, I think we're going to call it a day and uh, see you guys next week. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. All right. <laughs>